Kevin Witherspoon. I'm the chair of the Department of History and Philosophy here at Lander University. I am floored and blown away and, and pleased to see so many of you here on a Friday evening, including many students. So thank you for postponing your other activities and coming out for this very special event. Uh, of course, this is a panel discussion recognizing and honoring the life of Benjamin Mays. On behalf of Lander President Richard Cosentino and the rest of the Lander family, I want to extend a special greeting to the many of you who have come from out of town, uh, many at quite a great distance to be here tonight, <coughs> friends and family of Dr. Mays, students of Dr. Mays, and in some cases, students of students of Dr. Mays, and we are honored to have you all here tonight. My role this evening is essentially to get out of the way as quickly as possible, uh, make a couple of introductions and some quick announcements, but the folks you really want to hear from are seated to my left. I do have a couple of quick things to say before we begin. First of all, for you students thinking about Fowl's credit for tonight, I understand there was a bit of a mix up with the scanners on the way in. I think we have resolved that, so just make sure you get scanned on the way out we will sort out the rest so you can get your credit. You should also be aware that tonight's session is just the first in a weekend long celebration of the life and legacy of Benjamin Mays. Um, we are very privileged to be partnering with the Benjamin Mays Historical Preservation Site. Um, the real signature event of the weekend probably takes place tomorrow at 2 p.m. at the site. Uh, there will be the unveiling of the long-awaited and larger-than-life-size statue of Dr. Mays. Uh, that is, of course, open to the public, and if you look at your programs, you can see a full listing of the events of this weekend. Secondly, I want to point out that while our panelists are going to be explaining a great deal about the life of Benjamin Mays, we don't really have time for a full blow-by-blow -blow account of his life. So especially for those of you not familiar with his life story, I encourage you to consult your program where we have an abridged biography there, uh, and you can learn more about his life and those events. Similarly, I hope our panelists will forgive me if my introductions of them are very brief. We could spend the entire evening just celebrating the life and legacy of our panelists, but that's not what we're here for. So I will make very brief introductions and again, I encourage you to consult your program for a fuller description. So saying that, let me offer some brief introductions and we will get underway. Uh, first of all, we have Pastor Christopher Thomas, who, and I guess you can wave as I mention your names. Uh, he is the director of the Benjamin Mays Historical Preservation Site. And in a few moments, he's gonna be taking over the microphone and leading this panel discussion. Dr. Orville Vernon Burton, Creativity Professor of the Humanities and Professor of History, Sociology, and Computer Science at Clemson University. Author of the award-winning <coughs> books, The Age of Lincoln, and In My Father's House Are Many Mansions, among many other publications. Dr. Lawrence Carter, Professor of Religion and College Archivist and Curator at Morehouse College in Atlanta. He is also the Dean of the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel at Morehouse College. Dr. Otis Moss, Jr., formerly pastor of the Olivet Institutional Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio, and formerly co-pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta with Martin Luther King, Jr. himself. Dr. John H. Roper, Sr., a professor of history at Coastal Carolina University and author of The Magnificent Mays, a biography of Benjamin Elijah Mays, among many other publications. And Dr. Zachary Williams, Associate Professor of African American History at the University of Akron, and author of In Search of the Talented Tenth, Howard University Intellectuals and the Dilemmas of Race in Academia, 1926 to 1970, among many other publications. So thank you to all of our panelists. Let's greet them before we The legacy of Benjamin Mays stretches to every distant corner of the nation and beyond. His impact is felt literally everywhere. Greenwood County and Landry University are no exceptions. 
There are a few interesting ties between Lander University and Benjamin Mays, and it seems appropriate to mention them as we begin tonight. First, Lander University offers a scholarship in Mays' honor. The Mays Scholarship is awarded each year to an African-American student demonstrating need, academic ability, and leadership potential. The current holder of that scholarship, I understand, is in attendance tonight, or trying to be, uh, Ms. Aliyah Rice. Second, Lander University and its then president, Larry Jackson, were instrumental in the movement to establish the Benjamin Mays Historical Preservation Site and to preserve the Benjamin Mays home and move it to its current location, a process I know you'll hear more about tonight. And finally, on March 30th, 1974, Lander University recognized Dr. Mays with an honorary doctorate degree. I'll conclude my remarks this evening by quoting from his speech that day, a powerful reminder to all of us of the strides we have made as a region and a nation and the importance of our endeavors here as a university. On that day in 1974, Dr. Mays said, no man in my early years in the county could have dreamed it, that I, a black man, or any black man, would ever receive your most prestigious degree, Doctor of Humane Letters. You honor me today with my 34th honorary degree, 32 from the United States and two from Africa, 22 from white institutions and 12 from black institutions, from the South, East, and West. More than 125 awards hang on the walls of my family room, but believe me when I tell you that no honor, no award, no degree means quite as much to me as the honor you have conferred upon me today. To be recognized by my home county, a few miles from Phoenix, where I had my most terrifying early experience. To be recognized for what I have tried to be and what I have tried to do. And to be recognized for the bridges of understanding that I have tried to build to cement closer ties between blacks and whites in this country and in the world is a good feeling. On that note, let's get the session underway. We're going to begin with a brief film clip the trailer from a documentary about Dr. Mays called Born to Rebel, Driven to Excel. For those with little knowledge of Dr. Mays, this will be a good introduction to his life and legacy. When the film clip concludes, I will have stepped aside and Reverend Thomas will take the stage and he will lead the discussion from here. So again, welcome and enjoy the evening. say that I came out of my mother's womb kicking against segregation and discrimination. Mays is one of the most significant figures in American history. If it had not been for Dr. Mays, that would not have been a Martin Luther King. His influence over King caused America to change. He saw education as a pathway to fulfill his own destiny, but also to fulfill the destiny of an entire nation. One of the keys to his life was the proverbial challenge to students to do better, to aspire to higher possibilities, to have great ideals. Try to live up to your capacity. To live down below your capacity is the hardest thing. I don't know who else, presidents, vice presidents, whoever they may be, that had an impact in, in, in this world as much as Dr. Mays did. I think he took Jesus quite literally with this was the purpose of life feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to heal the sick, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And I don't think you can find a better legacy than that. So 
Dr. Mays begins uh, this trailer talking about that he was born kicking against Southern segregation. And in another clip, he talks about that when he was attending school at Bates College, that he had gone to see a filming of Birth of a Nation. And he said that for the first time in his life, he saw the kind of violence uh, in white New Englanders that he had saw in the South. And he said that he and his classmates, his black classmates, ran back to campus in fear. He also says that his earliest experiences in life were the experiences of the Phoenix riots. And so it's a period that covers from 1898 to 1920. And so I want to start this conversation tonight talking about the conditions of America at that time um, that literally propelled Dr. Mays into being the great person that he was. And Dr. Burton writes a tremendous about that in, in his uh, forward to Dr. Mays' autobiography, but I think sometimes we skip over that period in history and don't quite understand. Uh, and I want to start tonight by talking about uh, what the conditions were like after the end of the Reconstruction period up until Dr. Mays was sort of thrust into his uh, position globally. Anyone? <laughs> Dr. Bird. Oh, yeah. So Chris, you want me to talk about the conditions of reconstruction of Phoenix, right? What, I, I guess I lost the time period. That you were well, I, I want the, the audience to understand what was the conditions in America? What drove America from uh, the reconstruction period to southern segregation and Jim Crow? What was it that Mays was kicking against? Yeah. Well, I think to understand Dr. Mays, you have to understand uh, segregation and how it came about. Reconstruction uh, was an exciting period in democracy. And in South Carolina and in several other places, it led the nation in an interracial democracy. Uh, and I think that uh, we talk about how the, the victors write the history, but in this case, white Southerners actually wrote the history that's been a misinterpretation of Reconstruction. At least I have argued in the age of Lincoln and a lot of other places that as opposed to what Paul Bowers, who was basically a Democratic hack the Democratic Party, called the tragic era was a very exciting time of this interracial democracy. And in fact, um, I have a good friend who's passed away now, Jim Horton, an African-American historian, who wanted to get Disney to sort of make the symbol for Reconstruction, because things are, are so easily the way we look at symbols, to be the schoolhouse. And that's just one thing because it is primarily from African Americans. Robert Small, the great Civil War black leader and later Reconstruction Congressman and leader in South Carolina, is the person who introduced the bill that brought public education to South Carolina. But there was a violent coup d'etat and overthrow of Reconstruction. It's hard to believe in America, but it was the overthrow of a legitimately elected interracial government, the Republicans were in power, that ended Reconstruction. And then through that period, it really the 1890, a lot of violence. Um, Phoenix Wright is Dr. May's first memory as a child. And that's later, and that actually comes because after Ben Tillman, who is governor, leads then by that time senator, leads the 1895 Constitutional Convention to put it into law segregation. So it becomes really the law of the land and disfranchising African Americans. White Republicans, pretty much led by the Talberts out of 96, challenged that and African Americans voted, at which point uh, vigilantes rode throughout Greenwood County, Edgefield County, I guess it was not Greenwood County at the time, was it? It, it was, was uh, Edgefield, Edgefield and, and Abbeville. Yeah. Uh, and literally, just shot people, killed them, murdered them. It was a, it was a massacre that continued on and on. In fact, at least a year. Yeah. At which point, Ben Tillman comes to Greenwood and says, uh, "You know, you've got to stop this, or the federal government is going to come in and do something and, and stop this. If you, if you want to, uh, you know, do something." He said, "Cut off the head of the snake, kill the white collars instead of all of." Them. So that's the violence and the beginning of segregation and. My generation and so many us, all that people knew was segregation. Uh, it was even illegal for blacks and whites to work in the cotton mill together. So that meant there were basically no job for African American men, except in agriculture or, or a few other, other jobs. It, it permeated every aspect of life in the South. 
And you really cannot understand Dr. Mays unless you understand how he was fighting against segregation and what that meant at the time. Is this what you wanted me to That is what I wanted to say. I was. I mean, I can go on and on and on, but I think that's the essence of it. It's the height uh, up until the 18, and lynchings continue, but until the laws are in place, it's sort of the height of lynching, and literally then people legally know supposedly at least their relationship to each other, and segregation is a law of the land. And it's really that way until Brown v. Board changes that in 54, and it really doesn't hit. Uh, my good friend Steve Brown, who graduated from 96 with me, is here, and we graduated in 65, and it was still segregated some 11 years after, and from 96 high school, after Brown v. Board. It's not really until 1964 and the Civil Rights Act, and really 1971, at least the schools, but the cotton mills and others, they start to integrate whatever that means. I would argue we still have not reached an integrated society. I've got some quotes from Dr. Mays on that if we get to it, even today. So when I, when Dean Carter kindly invited me, it's been a long time now, about 1994, to a commemoration of Dr. May's 100th birthday uh, at Morehouse, and I was there, and I tend to think, but I'm not sure of this, I might, at least in this room discussion, have been the only non-African American. And a very dynamic, very smart African American minister from Texas made the statement that African Americans were better off under segregation than they were in it. And I felt very awkward because I waited for someone else to speak up, feeling very awkward, particularly being white. At which point I said, well, I remember segregation. And uh, first of all, we have not reached an integrated society. But this is what Dr. May fought against. It was an interesting divide, generation. Every person, I believe, who was my age and up sort of agreed with me, but younger people looked back and sort of saw this as a time when uh, it was opportunity for African-American businessmen, the communities were together, those <laughs> elites had not sort of moved out. Uh, and it was a time when everybody knew Benjamin e. Mays. It's hard for people to understand how important he was because the schools were segregated. And it was on the circuits of schools, the African-American schools, not just Claflin or South Carolina State, but throughout the United States where Dr. Mays would make these speeches that would inspire people, that would lead people to find ways to challenge segregation. Uh, and that's sort of where I was going. You know, when people look back longingly at this period, it was not a happy period. And this is what Mays dedicated his life to, was challenging segregation. I have some quotes too because he was pretty it was pretty, uh, I think, pressing at least in terms of after he hoped there would be integration, but that would not mean that people would not still be affected by those long years and centuries, not only of discrimination, but that the ideas of white supremacy would continue, and those would have to be fought against even after integration. I just want to add something real quick uh, on what Dr. Bird mentioned. I came to Dr. Mays via his autobiography. Uh, born to rebel. And the thing that sticks out in my mind is the earliest memories he has um, of the encounters of racial segregation uh, was as, what, a five or six year old. Uh, I have a six year old now. So to be able to take history through that lens and for that to frame your understanding, to me, sets the tone for the rest of his life. Um, and so for me, it's always interesting to understand stories of becoming. We understand you know, individuals once they reach their height, but how did they develop and evolve? What was the world in which they were shaped? How did that world shape them to go on to do the great things that they did? And so for me, a mantra for my life, an example was Dr. Mays, but also the mantra was born to rebel. So the thing that struck me, what about his life in South Carolina from that vantage point caused him to pin this title as his life's work. And so when reading that, it awakened me. In the words of James Baldwin with Fire Next Time, my dungeon shook. And for the rest of my life, I have been moved by his example in navigating the very complicated uh, parameters of life in South Carolina, being a Greenwood person myself. 
and, and what that was. And so I think that's an important way I come at it too, because here it says mob violence and lynchings were formidable facts of life for a black child. And when, black, when parents admonished their children, be careful and stay out of trouble, they had only one thing in mind, stay out of trouble with white people. Uh, and so how, as a child, when you're supposed to experience so many other things, does mob violence and lynching serve to be the foundation of your early years? I mean, how does that change you? And so for me, what he then goes on to do from there and becomes in, in, in interesting and important in the life of Dr. King and others, starts from that frame of reference, and so I just wanted to add that. Dr. May said that he learned that he was as good as any man, and he said that he learned that from his mother, who could not read or write. Uh, Dr. Roper, you talk quite a bit in your book about Dr. Mays' family in his early life. Tell us a little bit about how that influenced Dr. Mays and the person that he became, particularly his mother, Lavinia. Um, his mother did believe in what we would later call black pride. Yeah. And she spoke of Negro pride, the life term of the day. Uh, she insisted that he stand tall and that he learn. His father, Hezekiah, is named for an important Israeli reformist. His father wanted him to know how to do enough arithmetic not to be cheated in, mm. in the cotton. Mm. Mm -hmm. But his father didn't want him to proceed beyond that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was great father-son tension mediated by the mother and by other children. And I, I think finally mediated by, uh, by something like divine intervention uh, that, uh, that allowed him, it was an incredible struggle to get an education. Yes. He had to ride a train great distances to go to a <coughs> subpar school 30 miles away. And then finally, over his father's profound objection, he went to a high school at South Carolina State. And even there, it was a great difficulty because, as he records in here memorably, there were don't care boys who one of them actually took a knife to him. And it must have been a little like Jesus when the crowd wanted to throw him over the cliff. He doesn't explain how he didn't get killed, but he did yeah. get away, I think, again, by, because it wasn't his time yet, and God didn't want him to die. I brought a prayer that uh, Dr. Mays uh, used often, which I think catches much. Dear God, we need thee. Every hour, we need thee. Mm -hmm. We need that poise. We need that patience. We need that grace. We need that forgiveness. Dear God, great is that peace. Please God, in his name we pray. The words are simple. In looking at notes, I find that uh, the prayer emerged from Paul Arts Dunbar, Thomas Carlyle, Aristotle, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Mahatma Gandhi. So while the words are simple and are easily understandable, they come from quite a great depth by a person who is as great an intellectual as I have encountered. And my career is nothing but doing intellectual history. And I can say that trying to keep up with Dr. Mays kept me much busier than any of the other people. <laughs> <laughs> So Dr. Mays uh, goes on and he has this extraordinary journey to an education. Um, talk about how uh, his drive to uh, rid himself of the idea that he was inferior to whites drove Dr. Mays uh, to New England and to Bates College. And I think it's a significant story uh, in how uh, Mays was really driven because he wanted to prove that he was as adequate intellectually as any white man. And so it, it gave him this vision that he wanted to go to New England and compete with the minds of these Yankees. And what he meant was the minds of these New England white men that he had heard so much about how intelligent they were. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Mays' rise to education. In, uh, when, me, me, yes. when, when he went to uh, Bates College, um, he, he had had quite a struggle at Virginia Union where the Richmond black people were better educated than South Carolina and kind of, you know, up, uptown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was country. 
which I can relate to. Uh, and he, uh, he was sort of surprised he could get through Virginia Union, but he had a chance to go to Bates, a very, very fine school, a couple of years ago, the most expensive school in the United States. He got into a, a Greek class, and to do what he wanted to do, he understood he would have to learn Greek to get, make any sense out of the Bible. And um, he, was, he was teased mercilessly by a young man who noted his accent mm -hmm. as being from the Red Hills and Cotton Fields of the Piedmont, mm -hmm. which I again can have sympathy with. <laughs> uh, he finally went to the professor, Dr. Chase, and, and just said, I, I need help. And uh, Dr. Chase gave him personal help. And one bittersweet memory is that uh, Dr. Chase, uh, he, he was shoveling snow in front of the, Dr. Chase's house. And then Dr. Chase brought him in and fed him and sat him there with his white daughter, which simply could not be anywhere else in the world <laughs> for Dr. Mays at that time. Mm. And um, mm. the bittersweet memory is that he had frostbite still pinged him late in his years from that shovel in the snow. But anyway, Dr. Chase worked very hard with him on the Greek until he became so good at it that the young man, Paul, who was always laughing at him, began to ask Benny Mays to help him. So he came <laughs> full circle. Mm. And of course, the, the other thing that just uh, really hits me here is that Benny Mays never hesitated to help Paul, even though Paul had made fun of him. Well, I want to fast forward a little bit. We can't go year by year in Dr. Mays' life, but uh, by uh, the 1930s, uh, Dr. Mays is sort of progressing into his own. And, uh, he had, in 1934, becomes a dean of the School of Religion at Howard University. And, uh, he, published his first book, and so Dr. Mays is really becoming this great black theologian in, in American society. And I wanted to talk, uh, Dr. Carter, a little bit about what was Mays' significance to the nation as, as a theologian and a theological thinker? That's for me. Yes, sir. We're having trouble hearing behind you for some oh. reason, Chris. I okay, I'll try to talk into the mic a little bit. there, but we yeah. can't hear you. What was his significance as a theologian? Yes, yes. I don't know if my mic is on. Can you hear me? Yes. I was thinking about that about uh, two hours ago, and the thing that popped into my mind is that I don't think it's a coincidence or an accident that both Dr. Mays and Martin Luther King Jr. both chose the subject of God for their PhD dissertations. <laughs> Mays's was the Negro God as reflected in black literature, and King's was a comparison of the concept of God in the theology of Paul Tillich and Henry Nelson Wyman. Both of them had a powerful experience in the omnipresent sense of justice and I would say simply influence of God in the universe. For them, knowing was more significant than believing. They had powerful experiences of God. Mays experienced God powerfully in prayer. And he contributed to a book published in the 1950s where a number of black theologians <coughs> I wrote essays on why they believed in God. And of course we know what King's experience was regarding God in his Montgomery, Alabama 
kitchen. After the threatening phone calls one night, when he was really frightened by the threats on his life. There's something that I want to segue back to, and that is Dr. Williams wondering where this whole notion of rebellion came from in Mays. Whenever there are panels like this and lectures, inevitably the speaker takes everybody back to this five-year-old experience that Mays had. And I want to posit, I've not done this before, I want to put forth a thesis of where I think the notion of rebellion started in Mays. This won't surprise you. And it is in this quote that he gives us in his autobiography that many of you have already heard, where he says, and I quote, I remember a crowd of white men who rode up on horseback with rifles on their shoulders. I was with my father when they rode up, and I remember starting to cry. They cursed my father, drew their guns, and made him salute, made him take off his hat, and bow down to them several times. Then they rode away. I was not yet five years old, but I have never forgotten them. That mob is my earliest memory. When I read this this afternoon, something jumped out at me. Made him salute, cursed my father, drew their guns, made him take off his hat, and bow down to them several times. Young Benny understood early that degrees from well-known schools, high position, worldly recognition, all of this is hollow and unenduring if a man or that man's son can be forced to bow down before those whom he does not respect, to bow down before those he does not respect. Now, Dr. Williams, I am now convinced that when you connect all of the dots, that was the beginning, the inauguration and the birth of the spirit in Maze to rebel. And what was he rebelling against? Being disrespected. And that's why we remember him saying to the Morehouse students, never let anybody dismiss you with the wave of a hand or the shrug of a shoulder. He spent his entire life commanding respect. And he won. Big time. And that's why he had to leave Virginia Union. And he believed that there was power in the universe on the side of justice, power beyond human control that he could call on in prayer to assist him personally.
explain racism, discrimination, being removed from the dining car of a train so that he had to back out in front of white men with clenched fists and guns. He told the students at Morehouse, don't go to theaters and sit in the balcony. If you have to ride a bus and get on the front, go through the front door and deposit your coin, your fare, and you have to get off and go to the back door in order to go on and take a seat in the rear. He said, make sure that when you're sitting down that your mind takes its seat on the first row. Mm. And then he became very radical. Now hear this, this theology. He said, if Jesus himself, he said this in Sale Hall Chapel at Morehouse, if Jesus himself came to Atlanta to preach in a white pulpit, I wouldn't go to hear him. And you shouldn't even. That idea is coming from a place of trying to conscientize the students not to put themselves in places where they won't be respected. He used to wear a hat. And he was all dressed up one day. And a white gentleman passed him and knocked his hat off. And went on into a store, murmuring to Mays, you think you're cute. Mays said, after that, I decided to stop wearing hats. He said, there are segregated elevators in the towers in downtown Atlanta. I had to do business several flights up, and I decided I was not going to ride a segregated elevator. So I walked every time up many flights of stairs. He believed that God was on the side of justice. And so, this required tremendous strength and discipline on his part. And so this is what he told the Morehouse students. With this view of life, we can understand why Mays told the students that they needed seven, he said, selves of success. Self-confidence, self-control, self-awareness, Self-respect, self-reliance, self-esteem, self-belief. And all of those seven selves pointed to an eighth self, self-realization, which is not a belief in selfishness. But if you're concerned about the whole community, you will evolve yourself so that the impact you have in your behavior and your actions can become a universal law for everybody else to do the same. One of the great legacies of Dr. Mays was the students who he reproduced this spirit in. And Dr. Moss, you were one of those uh, protégés of Mays. H how did Mays impact you in, in your course to be a clergyman and to do all that you've done in your service for the Lord? H how did Mays impact your life and your ministry through uh, the time that you were around him as a young man? In many ways. One, before I met him, growing up in rural Georgia, there were a few black men who had a relationship with Morehouse College. But all of the African American ministers in my area had high regard for Morehouse College. 
And as a child, that regard was constantly expressed through their respect for Dr. Mays. The elementary school principal in LaGrange, Georgia, I didn't live in LaGrange, I lived out from LaGrange. Uh, I will tell you how to get that in a minute. <laughs> the principal of the elementary school in LaGrange, Georgia, was a Morehouse man. His daughter was the first wife of Dr. Howard Thurman. She died at a very early age. And he was instrumental, being a deacon at First Baptist Church, in getting ministers to First Baptist from Morehouse, one of which was the late Dr. Sandy Ray. Another was the late Dr. Fail D. Hale, class of 40, Dr. Ray, class of 31. Another was the Reverend R. L. Hill, I think the class of 50. And another, the Reverend Charles Hamilton, class of uh, 51. All of these men brought the image and influence of Morehouse College and especially of Benjamin Elijah Mays. The principal of our high school before I got there was a graduate of Morehouse, C.E. Warner. His uh, son was Dr. Warner, outstanding physician whose widow is present uh, this afternoon or this evening. Those influences, both verbal, visible, and invisible, impacted our lives. So we heard the drumbeat of rebellion at an early age. One of our cousins was lynched when I was about 12 years old. And that story has just resurfaced uh, in recent months when the granddaughter of the sheriff who shot our cousin apologized to the family. But, like the writer about Joan, Joan of Arc, when the saints are congratulating her on being a, becoming a saint, through Shaw, I believe, raises the question, can you unburn me? <laughs> Some harm is irreparable. <laughs> and we learn through those individuals what a Benjamin E. Mays was like. I walked six miles to hear him speak at a very early age and could not get in the place. The auditorium was packed. It was a graduation service. I was disappointed, so I went outside and stood by his automobile <laughs> and waited for him just to have an opportunity to shake his hand and said to him, I will see you at Morehouse. I had no money <laughs> and did not know how the journey would be made. But a few years later, standing on the lawn of the president of Morehouse College when Dr. and Mrs. Mays were giving a reception for freshman students. I shook his hand again hmm. and said, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> it was that kind of influence, that kind of integrity and 
that kind of reality and spirituality that touched so many of us throughout our lives. So I grew up with a kind of made acquaintance, amazed mystique, <laughs> and amazed challenge. Mm. And it was in chapel as a freshman that we heard him give the words that people repeat so often. You ought to reach for the moon and try to grasp the stars. And uh, I will not go on with that because I'm supposed to speak to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Williams, I was uh, reading a Pittsburgh Courier article one time and it was about uh, the death of Charles Richard Drew. And I was, as I was reading that article, it seemed so personal in nature to me, the words that Dr. Mays was writing about, and later came to find out that he was on staff uh, at Howard University uh, with Dr. Drew. And so talk a little bit about, you, you write significantly about it in your, in your book, uh, In Search of the Talented Tenth. Um, it's been said of Mays that he was the new Negro before the new Negro. Uh, and so many of you all may not know what that terminology is about, he can explain it to you. But uh, talk a little about, about the intellectual heritage that, that Mays was a part of during his years at, at Howard University from 1934 to 1940. Well, uh, to, to continue on with what uh, Dr. Moss and Dr. Carter and Dr. Bergen Roper have said, uh, Dr. Mays' form of years um, shaped him and that's what he took with him to Washington DC which was a very segregated city the nation's capital yes but very segregated by many respects um, and even though it was Howard being the the major destination for a lot of intellectuals who received many of their degrees from some of the most prestigious institutions of higher learning they could not oftentimes go back and teach at those very same institutions mm -hmm. Even the great W.B. Du Bois um, educated not only at Harvard, uh, being the first African-American PhD in history, but also educated in, uh, in Europe and Germany, could not. And so he pins his epic work, 1903, in Atlanta, Georgia, The Souls of Black Folk. So Dr. Mays in the 30s is in D.C. And in some ways, as a result of Jim Crow uh, and also the vision of Mordecai Johnson, also Morehouse man, uh, a, a formative and impressive intellectual community, which included men and women intellectuals, was uh, developed at Howard University in this milieu, in this environment that uh, in many ways was the seat of policy, but also the seat of a very strong um, tinge of racial segregation. And so uh, the community wasn't monolithic, but uh, they were able to develop this sort of cadre and, and collection mainly as a result of uh, Dr. Johnson's vision. And so uh, uh, Dr. Mays, Dr. Thurman, and many others um, you know, populated this, this intellectual community. But let me just say, they were not just uh, ebony tower intellectuals. They went beyond. Uh, Howard was a hop, skip, and a jump from Washington, D.C., Georgia Avenue. And so they were in the throes, in the midst of a, a teeming and bustling city, but even continuing on with the idea of, of, of rebellion and, and refusing to be held uh, in, in limitation, um, the entire city and the entire world was their uh, classroom. Um, and so they would write in the Pittsburgh Courier um, and many other black periodicals about what was happening in the United States, but also around the world. Uh, not feeling constricted by boundaries, so they would talk about the color line around the world. Um, with some sense of authority and some sense of understanding, um, and a sense of hopefulness, right? While also having this sense of critique, uh, believing that we could be better. And so Dr. Mays is, is blending uh, the mind of an administrator, an academic, a theologian, um, as well as a, a pastor in many ways, and a preacher uh, in his position, and trying to help build up the school of religion um, at a time not long after <laughs> which Dr. Johnson gains accreditation. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, well, appropriation, excuse me, uh, for Howard, which for many black colleges at that time was unheard of. But this appropriation was also in the context of a Congress that was controlled by Southern <coughs> segregations. And so in, in getting the annual appropriation, which was always challenged, um, what came along with that, the, the freedom of speech and speaking out on issues was also challenged and critiqued as well, but nevertheless, Dr. Mays and other thinkers and scholars of Dr. Johnson 
uh, regardless of his critics on campus, um, shepherded an institution that uh, was at the forefront of civil rights. Uh, with Charles Thompson and the Journal of Negro Education providing a sort of venue for public intellectuals all across the country to be able to uh, wage a challenge against segregation, teeming with what Charles Hamilton Houston and others did in the law school, Dr. Mays and Dr. Thurman in the uh, School of Religion, um, and then other experts uh, in foreign policy, uh, Merce Tate and others. Uh, you had an, an impressive community that connected the life of the mind and the heart and, and sought to help promote change. And, and so I think to me that, that uh, something I marveled at because in that context, it was certainly um, uh, impressive and in many ways unheard of, although there were other institutions that had very strong um, faculty as well. But what Howard scholars were able to do in Washington, D.C., uh, set a trend that in many ways sent shockwaves throughout the nation. And all the ripples and connections from Morehouse to Howard uh, and then beyond <laughs> are also running through that, that community. So that's what drew me to that subject. How can a collection of scholars and thinkers um, be so engaged, so galvanized, so determined, so focused? Um, and how, how is community created? And not in a sense where it's uniform, but where it's very different, but yet they can have a sense of uniformity to challenge the big issues of the day of racial segregation. Um, and I've not seen that sort of collection since. I mean, there have been other comparisons, but considering the context and considering what was brought to the table and the politics and circumstances, to me, it was unprecedented, but still it points a marker to what is the, the standard for what an institution of higher education should do in terms of being uh, responsible scholars and scholars who are scholar activists who see their boundaries as more than just the classroom but the world mm -hmm. and engaging with the world. And so uh, for me it was still something that I'm still wrestling with in terms of his and others' importance and significance in that particular community. Chris, before we leave too much, can I say a little bit more about Dr. Mays as a theologian. Absolutely. Because I, I really think people don't understand how important it was. He's been listed as one of the three greatest theologians of the 20th century. I would put him, like I said often before, I think certainly the greatest person to come out of South Carolina. I'd put him number one as the theologian. But the whole idea of what we call the black church, or as he termed it, the Negro church, was largely Mays' invention. The notion of treating black religiosity and all of its diversity as a single collectivity, or as you would say, community almost, in, in, in your words. He did so as much to criticize it as praises. And here's a, here is a, uh, from the conclusion of the 1933 book, The Negro's Church by Dr. Mays, and this is Dr. Mays' word. The analysis reveals that the status of the Negro church is in part a result of the failure of American Christianity in the realm of race relations that the church's program, except in rare instances, is static, non-progressive, and fails to challenge the loyalty of many of the most critically-minded Negroes, that the vast majority of his pastors are poorly trained theologically, that more than half of the sermons analyzed are abstract and imbued with a magical conception of religion, that in church schools less than one-tenth of the teachers are college graduates. And yet, if the Negro church critiques the black church, it was much harder on the white church. Both Mays and you've heard mentioned now um, Howard Thurman uh, several times, and I'm working with a, a Thurman biographer, Peter Eisenstadt. We're doing a, a study of these extraordinary intellectuals, I think, in terms of how they influenced, in fact, American thought, not just black thought. They're, they're critical to understand the intellectual history of the United States. But at Howard, those two in particular tried to fashion a new black liberal Christianity acceptable to young skeptics while staying true to his function to give African Americans a haven from white oppression. I think that's very important, and I'll conclude with this, I don't want to run on and on, but for both of these men, Dr. Mays and Howard Thurman, I think nothing weighed heavier on them than the paradox of having to live and work within segregated institutions in order to fashion an attack on segregation. I can go on and on, but I think that's... I'd like to say something. Yeah. Perhaps we do not focus on that, on 
Howard University between 1926 and the 1950s. And when we do, we often forget Monica Johnson, President. Benjamin Elijah Mays, Dean of the School of Religion. Howard Thurman, Dean of the Chapel. That is a part that is often overlooked. Now, it's impossible to deal with Morehouse without looking at 1940 to 1967. But we often miss <coughs> the influence of a Benjamin Elijah Mays in theology, in teaching, and in producing scholars. Morehouse, 1920 to 1923, Dr. Mays was teaching mathematics and psychology. Talk Howard Thurman too, did One of his uh, most brilliant students, he has said in writing and uh, from the platform, was Howard Thurman. Another was uh, Dr. Nabry. These influences, as a matter of fact, I had a conversation with Dr. Thurman who talked about how Dr. Mays insisted on excellence and punctuality. It was even said that he stood at the door of his class and if the bell would ring before you got in the door, you couldn't come in. That was a, I don't know if it's legend or not, but one instance where a young man had one foot inside the door and Dr. Mays said, your foot is on time, but the rest of your body is <laughs> Your foot is permitted to come in, but not the rest of <laughs> These kind of stories, of course, Dr. Thurman said, Dr. May said, you are late and you can't come in. He always wondered how the Kant got out of 96. <laughs> <laughs> Both the realities and the legends are teachable and challenging. I think this is a good place for me to come in and to say that in the 1920s, after Monica Y. Johnson became president of Howard, and in the 1930s, Johnson crisscrossed the nation trying to persuade black America to adopt nonviolence, the tactics of nonviolence for addressing segregation. Hmm. In 1936, Howard Thurman and a small delegation of African Americans were the first to meet face to face, first African Americans to meet face to face with Mahatma Gandhi and to interview him for a half day on the relevance of nonviolence for ending American segregation. Now there's a lot that happened during that half-day interview. But Dr. Thurman returned to Howard University where he was, as has been said, he was the first dean of chapel at Rankin Chapel. And he gave his report to President Johnson. Remember, President Johnson is a 1911 graduate, graduate of Morehouse. Dr. Thurman is a 1923 graduate of Morehouse. Thurman, Mays, and Johnson were faculty members also in the School of Religion. Johnson was so impressed with Thurman's report 
that he called an unscheduled meeting of the Howard faculty in Rankin Chapel and asked Dr. Thurman to tell what he had learned from Gandhi. Hmm. Benjamin Mays, the dean of the School of Religion, was in the audience. From the platform, Dr. Thurman urged President Johnson and Dean Mays to go to India to confirm what he had discovered. The same year, December 31st, Dr. Mays arrived on Gandhi's doorstep, interviewed him, returned to the United States, and wrote up the report of the interview of Gandhi in the Norfolk Journal and Guide newspaper, and later in the national edition of the Pittsburgh Courier. Perhaps, Sally, this is a good place for me to announce. Dr. Mays, from 1946 to 1982, published 1,800 articles, editorials, one a week in the Pittsburgh Courier. <coughs> he addressed every subject, <laughs> but he was very consistent on praise for drum majors for justice around the world and addressing social issues from a moral perspective. I think I should tell you that Thurman's roommate at Morehouse was James Madison Nabry. He graduated in 23 also and went on to get his law degree from Northwestern and was hired by Mordecai Johnson at Howard to teach in the law school. Nabrit taught the very first course ever taught in the American Legal Academy on civil rights law. Guess who his greatest student was? Thurgood Marshall. And the two of them, with Robert Carter, with the three lawyers who pleaded the case for school desegregation in 1954 before the Supreme Court. And we all remember the famous picture of them with their toothy grins on the steps of the Supreme Court. That's a little vignette of how interwoven the Morehouse alumni history is with the Civil Rights Movement. That's not all. When you talk about Benjamin Mays, we need to bring out of the darkness who his mentors were. I won't name them all, but there are three that need to be mentioned in this context. John Hope, the first self-identified African-American president of Morehouse College. Upon his appointment in 1906, it was announced that he would be the first civil rights president of a liberal arts college in the American Academy. He was mentored in equal rights by the school's founder, William Jefferson White. And that is an Everest of a story that has yet to be told. <laughs> how Morehouse College got branded in equal rights and civil rights and human rights. Martin King is not an accident, and it begins with our founder and mushrooms with King. But between the two is a tremendous procession of giants that includes Mays. But I need to tell you something else about Mays. Hope, Mordecai Johnson, and Robert Maynard Hutchins had powerful 
impacts on maize. Maybe I should tell you that Robert Maynard Hutchins was president of the University of Chicago who signed Mays' master's and PhD degrees. Now that's another Everest <laughs> that I don't have time to go into. But Mordecai Johnson, Mays met in his third year teaching at Morehouse in the early 1920s, 1921 to 1923. John Hope invited Mordecai Johnson to speak in chapel. Mays was blown away by the eloquent challenges that Johnson issued to the student body and his use of what Mays called the social gospel to address the social issues. Now, there's something else that needs to be announced that I've never heard before said in public about all of this. Many people credit Mays with bringing the mystique to Morehouse. But Mays himself said, the reason I accepted the presidency in 1940 of Morehouse College was because of what I discovered when I went there in 1921. He said, I accepted the presidency because I discovered in 1921 an unusual, a powerful inspiration on the Red Hill in Georgia. And I accepted the presidency in order to return to make sure that that inspiration that I found in 1921 never left. He praised Mordecai Johnson for his inspiration and his eloquence and his orientation to social justice and also for his nonviolence. And he said all of this in the eulogy that he delivered for Mordecai Johnson in Rankin Chapel. Now, you've all heard the name Eugene Debs. Mays was a moral cosmopolitan. Let me quickly tell you how this happened. And then I will give somebody else the mic. <laughs> Mays encountered Eugene Debs in the 1920s. And in case you're missing it, what I'm trying to do is to help you understand how Mays became widely known as the mentor to Martin Luther King Jr. It's tied up in everything that I've said. But Mays was very impressed with Debs, whom he greatly admired and frequently quoted. And Mays was haunted by the few lines I'm going to quote from Debs that I think hold an important key. These are the words of Eugene Debs. As long as there is a lower class, I am in it. As long as there is a criminal element, I am of it. And as long as there is a man in jail, I am not free. Mays identified himself with all of people of all of those conditions. And his moral concern stretched across all fences and boundaries, and his morality was never hijacked by his membership in groups. <laughs> And he infused this into his writings, his sermons, his addresses, which are phenomenal in terms of the quantity of writing that he did. So much so that it has been said that if a survey were done 
on the amount of writing of a college president in the United States during his tenure as president, in terms of who did the most, Mays would have to be considered <laughs> to fit among the top five. I'll stop. <laughs> about 15 minutes left and I really want to talk in this last section about uh, the mentees of Mays, um, those men that Mays had such a profound influence on their lives and who they became. Uh, Dr. Oprah, do you want to talk some about uh... Well, it's hard to imagine the civil rights movement without the way he mentored Dr. Both Dr. King, you know, Martin Luther King and Martin Luther Jr. usually come to mind first. But there are so many, and y'all have expressed it more eloquently than I can. Uh, there was a Morehouse man. You're absolutely correct, it was there before, before Dr. Mays got there, and he made himself into the Morehouse man. And then he carried it, I think, some places uh, probably beyond what Dr. Hope could have done. Uh, Andrew Young, Maynard Jackson, the list just goes on and on on and on. And uh, it, it uh, there were Minty's other places too, but at a time when he was retired from running Morehouse, he took over the Atlanta School Board. And uh, of course we were having the, the infamous white flight and uh, poor distribution of tax revenues, and it was an almost hopeless situation, but he did produce his Atlanta Compromise, where there'd be magnet schools that would get special funding, mm -hmm. and he would make sure that there were some opportunities for the brightest black kids in Atlanta to go as far as they possibly could mm -hmm. in the high school setting. And given the awfulness of the context, I don't think anybody could have worked. Again, I think there's divine help here. I don't think anybody could have worked more with what little he had to work with. Mm. Dr. Carter? <laughs> there's just so much that crowds in. Just think a little longer. <laughs> Let me uh, reference something. Under Dr. Mays' leadership as president of the Atlanta, of the uh, Board of Education for, of Atlanta, he recruited or uh, led in the recruitment of the first African American superintendent of the Atlanta public school. And this was not just a, a kind of historic breakthrough for Atlanta, but it was a lesson to the nation. There were other school board presidents across the nation who turned to Dr. Mays for counsel and advice. There is a controversial chapter that we do not have time to go into this afternoon with reference to a serious challenge between the Atlanta Board of Education and the NAACP. I sat in the courtroom, federal courtroom in Atlanta, when a white superintendent under oath said that the, the Atlanta schools were not segregated. <laughs> and the judge looked at me. <laughs> and said, how can you say that when we all know it's been that way for 90 years? Mm -hmm. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And uh, the lawyer, who was a state paid lawyer, said, Your Honor, what we are trying to say is they haven't proved it yet. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> when the superintendent of a school system is carrying that kind of falsehood, and you could call it something else, <laughs> what does that say for the education of our children. Hmm. Integrity came to the school system under the leadership nice. of Dr. Mays. I'd like to give you a couple of vignettes that I think you might appreciate. A little historical trivia. Dr. Mays was the very first African American to address the nation on television in the 1950s on NBC on a Sunday morning. That footage is available. When Dr. Mays ran for the for elected office in Atlanta, <coughs> he never campaigned one hour. He simply put a sign on top of his car and went about his errands around town. <laughs> he was elected, and when he ran for the presidency of the school board, he did the same thing, and he was elected overwhelmingly. Here's a little story that uh, I learned while working in Dr. Mays' basement with Sally Warner, his secretary. I was told that uh, one example of how disciplined Dr. Mays was was that in all of his years of driving, he never got a ticket. There was no blemish on his record whatsoever. And the authorities in the city of Atlanta were quite amazed <coughs> that this could actually happen. And so someone was asked, how did he pull that off? And this is the answer that they received. Dr. Mays was observed by a Morehouse student, who happened to have been the son of Pinky Haynes, driving around town very carefully with one foot on the accelerator and the other on the brakes. <laughs> so that if he ever had to stop suddenly, he didn't have to move a foot. <laughs> <laughs> That's an example of discipline. <laughs> Here's something else that I think you might find interesting. In all of his years of serving as president of Morehouse, which was 27 years, he never accepted a salary higher than he could pay his highest paid faculty member. Oh, <laughs> Honoraria that he got from speaking engagements went into accounts so that long after he had transitioned, he had it worked out so that his contributions would be kicking into institutions that, of his choice. His philanthropy survived him. Yeah. Just thought you ought to know. <laughs> So Dr. Mays left a lasting legacy upon uh, American, the landscape of American history. Uh, I'm going to just give you an opportunity. I'm going to go around the panel just to have last remarks, and then we're going to have an opportunity for the crowd to ask a few questions. But uh, if you could say what was the most significant uh, contribution of Mays to American history, uh, you all can tell me what you think that might have been. Dr. Mays served as the official representative of the National Baptist Convention USA, Inc. on the Central Committee of the World Council of Churches. And 
the founding session for the World Council in 1948 was held in Amsterdam, Holland. And Dr. Mays was a part of the discussions that brought about the founding. But in the course of the discussion, the subject of South Africa came up and apartheid. And Dr. Mays sprang to his feet spontaneously and started a debate which greatly influenced the decision regarding the churches, the Christian churches of South Africa coming into the World Council of Churches of Christ segregated. Dr. Mays argued that this could not be permitted. And so they were not admitted. That was 1948. The year we dedicated the 6,000 pipe organ in the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel. Dr. Gloucester and I made the decision to give the organ to the world because it was the International Chapel. And so we chose Philip Potter, the first black general secretary of the World Council to come and be the speaker. He was so thrilled when he got the invitation, he paid his own way from Geneva, Switzerland. We had a significant crowd in the chapel that day to dedicate the Wendell P. Whalen pipe organ. Potter was introduced, he got up, he walked to the Cornell Everett Talley pulpit, looked out across the audience and looked down and he said, oh my God, I cannot proceed as I was about to start my <coughs> remarks. I have just spotted Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays sitting on the first row by himself with his cane. He said, I must tell you the effect that Dr. Mays has had on my career. He said, Dr. Mays, I was 18 years old and I was in the room when you spontaneously jumped to your feet and started the debate on why the churches of South Africa, the Christian churches, could not come into the World Council of Churches segregated because of apartheid. Your debating arguments that you marshaled were so powerful that it launched my career into ecumenics. And that has landed me in this position today of being a spokesman for 400 million Christians as the first black general secretary. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you. Sixteen months before Rosa Parks sat down, Benjamin Mays stood up before the Second Assembly of the World Council of Churches in Evingston, Illinois, on the campus of Northwestern University, and delivered a keynote address that you can read in the appendix of Born to Rebel. That address internationalized the civil rights movement 16 months before Rosa Parks sat down. One more story. <laughs> before, before he tells that story, if anyone would like to ask our panelists a question, I'm going to ask that you make your way down to that platform center right there, and they will bring the microphone to you. So while Dean Carter's having his, these last comments, if anyone wants to ask a question, you can make your way to the platform. We may not have time to get to all your questions, but certainly we will try to get some of your questions answered. Dean Carter.
Now, what I'm about to tell you is probably my most powerful experience with Dr. May. I invited him to deliver what became his last sermon to Morehouse College. I had never heard Dr. Mays preach. And he delivered the sermon that is published in his book titled, Disturbed About Man, You Shall Reap What You Sow. So you can get that and you can read it. Dr. Mays did something in that sermon that I have never seen done before nor since. I don't think we'll probably ever see again. But I've heard about how powerful a speaker he was, and I was literally sitting on the edge of my seat to have this experience. Dr. Mays started behind the lectern, and he never left the lectern. And he never made any dramatic gestures with his hands. He stood flat-footed. But as he started, I was on one end of the stage, and there were 20 red chairs across the stage filled with my chapel assistants. And the organist was on the other side. So from where I was seated, as the row of chairs were curved, I could see everybody on the stage and the congregation over here. And I had a side view of Dr. Mays. The first thing I noticed was that he started speaking with a cadence that seemed to be measured. It seemed to have the same number of words or syllables in each line that he uttered. And he would utter one sentence. and then utter another. And about the third time he did that, the congregation seemed to get in the rhythm. And I noticed that Dr. Mays would make an utterance and his body would slightly go through as if to create more intimacy with his congregation, more rapport. And while he was preparing for the second utterance, the congregation would respond. And he would move back. And then when the second came, and the third and the fourth, it was clear that there was a rocking motion. Hmm. And I, at one point, thought, my goodness, isn't this interesting? I wonder how long he can keep that up. <laughs> <laughs> And so, it continued. It did not stop. And I thought it so unusual, I decided to look away to see whether the chapel assistants seated in the 20 and the 19 other chairs, because I was seated in one, were recognizing what I was recognizing, and they were looking straight ahead, but Lamar Alfred was standing near the organ council. And he saw me looking and looked at me and went, <laughs> it's like, how is he doing this? <laughs> and I looked back at Dr. Mays and looked at the congregation, and the congregation was going forward. <laughs> <laughs> well, this went throughout the whole sermon. And you know what I saw? He actually hypnotized <laughs> Now, I know that's hard to believe, but it's true. It happened. And so, you can, I couldn't wait to get out of there because I wanted to ask Dr. Mays and I wanted to ask Dr. Gloucester, who was the seventh president, who succeeded Dr. Mays, and Dr. Mays chose Dr. Gloucester to be president. So, 
While Dr. Mays was shaking hands, I walked over to Dr. Gloucester in the lobby and I said, how did he do that? <laughs> and Dr. Mays said, well, we've asked him that before. And he told us that it happened when he and Joseph Nicholson were gathering data for their book on the Negro's church before the age of the tape recorder. Dr. Nicholson and Dr. Mays, and I don't think either ones at that time were doctors, had to go into the rural areas of the South, <laughs> and by hand, they recorded the sermons of untutored, unlettered Negro preachers mm -hmm. who had not been influenced by Anglos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Mays said that he wrote down word for word what he heard, but that he did not realize that something unconscious had happened until he got up to deliver his own sermons and he discovered that something kind of African had been imbibed. And he had gotten this from these experiences with these black rural preachers who had not ever sat in an integrated classroom. thought you'd be interested in knowing. <laughs> Good evening, Dean Carter, De Quincy Hens, Dr. Moss, Zach, uh, Dr. Burton, Dr. Roper. I want to say uh, to all of you, welcome to Greenwood. We're so happy you came to our town. Uh, I know Zach and Dr. Berg, we're all natives of this area. We want to welcome Dean Carter and Dr. Roper and Dr. Moss. I, I just have one, well, two questions. Um, my first question is, can you, I've read a lot about Dr. Mays growing up in Greenwood and going to Morehouse, Morehouse class in 1996. And I uh, was president of the Chapel Assistance. Dr. Carter was my mentor at Morehouse. And, um, but I read a lot about Dr. Mays and, and Greenwood. And I, I just want to ask that you would just maybe share a bit about Dr. Mays' love for Greenwood and how he would often return to Greenwood and give back to Greenwood. And then also, can you speak to us about what Dr. Mays' legacy means for the moment that we're in in this country right now? I can uh, speak from someone who grew up here. I think it does go the lesson that my generation and, and Jack's too were one where historians sort of uh, took what we thought of as heroes and showed their foibles. And that's not wrong. That's good to understand these sort of things. It's interesting to me because uh, uh, of all the people I have studied, uh, usually the more you learn about somebody, uh, the, the less you see them <laughs> heroic. That's not the case for me with Dr. Mays at all. Extraordinary <clears throat> hero, as I learned similar with Abraham Lincoln for, for different reasons. But while I think it's good that maybe we got rid of something, the idea of heroes, role models are important. And I said just recently, we do not learn our histories from the books that historians write, or my grandchildren would have a lot larger education fund. <laughs> we learn it from what people tell us is important. Mm -hmm. That house on the corner, that monument, that statue. 
And that's where people learn their history. Greenwood has done an amazing thing here. I believe this is the first statue of a person. And it is a statue of a person. who I do think is the greatest person to come out of South Carolina, let alone Greenwood, or we like to say in 96, 96. Uh, but it's also an educator, which is saying something about what's important in democracy. When you ask about Dr. Mays, I, I, there are a lot of titles, but one of them is the, the spiritual godfather of the civil rights. There's so much, and that's all of it, but it was education. It was education, I really believe, he taught and he was a role model. Just a little bit about when my dear friend Steve Brown and I grew up in 96. There was a marker there, a historical marker, and it was to Preston Brooks, who you might remember, <laughs> came Senator Charles Sumner in the Senate chamber. I mean, horribly, mm -hmm. came. Mm -hmm. And you know, <coughs> people learn from those monuments. It is not coincidental that we were state champs in football because it taught every little boy and maybe every little girl too. The way you're going to get memorialized and have a market is be to fire people. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we are sending now a different message with this. And one of the horrors of segregation is I did not know who Dr. Mays was, though he came to 96. He visited Rowley, he visited others, he came back regularly, uh, even at times, you know, during segregation. It was not until my senior year at Furman University during Religious Simpson Week when Dr. James Pitt, the chaplain, or associate chaplain, brought Dr. Mays there, and I met him and found him from 96. Now, it was not that the town fathers and mothers of 96 weren't recognizing Dr. Mays, it was they did not know that he existed. This is one of the horrors of segregation that we just did not know. Now we know, and I think what we have done, or you have done, I should say, in South Carolina and Greenwood, is to give us a way to speak to those issues today in terms of recognizing a role model who understood the humanity of his oppressors. You cannot read born to rebel and has said that first memory of seeing, in fact, his father humiliated, his own self being spit at by someone and then, you know, literally being nice to that person's widow in 96, on and on. Someone who understood the humanity of their oppressors yet of, of such pride that he changed the world for the better. He inspired others and I think through what you've done at Greenwood can inspire our better angels to do things. So I really admire what you've done. I'm so proud of my home community that you are, I think, leading the way in probably the most difficult time we've had in America, I would say, since the Civil War, in terms of when I see that democracy itself, something that Ben Mays championed and believed in, he believed in the democratic system, that he could, through education, change people. I think democracy is more challenged now than at any time since the Civil War, and we have a good role model uh, So I'll stop with that. We are out of time. Should I? Okay. Can I take this one last question? You think, Dr. Wispo? One last question, and then we're going to close out tonight. My question was, you have already answered it, but what is the effect that Dr. Mays has had personally on your career? Personal. Could you repeat the question, please? What is the effect that Dr. Mays has had personally on your career? Although you may not have met him, what is the effect that he has had personally? In a sentence. I think she said, what is, what is the influence Dr. Mays has personally on the group, I think. Was that the question? Career. Oh, on your career. On your career. Dr. Moss. Um, what influence has Dr. Mays had on your career, personally? In one sentence, Dr. Witherspoon said. <laughs> I don't think in my 60 plus years of ministry, I have ever preached a sermon, whereas either in the preparation 
or in the presentation, somewhere Dr. Mays appeared. <laughs> Sometimes it was almost embarrassing. <laughs> Urging the best. Nothing but excellence. I also think, and this is not in the question, that it would be good to have some serious discussions on the life of Benjamin Elijah Mays in the age of Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll close on that idea tonight. Give this panel a hand tonight if you would.